Committee for the Film Festival, and this summer I watched a lot of films, and when I watched this one, I think that evening I reenacted and recapped the whole thing to my husband, uh, because I found it so, most of you, if not all of you, feel the same way. Uh, of course, know about Thomas Jefferson and Monticello, I know about the ladies from the exhibits here in the museum, but had not heard about the story. So Steve, the first question, how did you learn about the history of the ladies uh, in Monticello, and how did you come to make this film? Sure, thank you, Irene. It's such a pleasure uh, to be here, and particularly uh, both in Philadelphia and here in this museum. Uh, and before I address your answer, uh, I have to actually correct something that it's possible some folks here might have even noticed in the film. So I'm going to fall on my sword here and admit to a slight mistake uh, that uh, Mel Yurofsky, who's one of the interview subjects, there was a reference in the film to Uriah Levy's will that he wanted to leave Monticello to the United States government, which turned it down. He wanted to leave it to the state of Virginia, which turned it down. Uh, and then in his will, he then said, well, if that's the case, I want to leave it to three Sephardic synagogues, one in New York, one in Philadelphia, and one in Richmond, Virginia. And Mel, unfortunately, and I failed to catch this, Mel mentions Road of Cholo, uh, which is not a Sephardic synagogue in the city of Philadelphia. He should have said Mikvah Israel, two blocks from here. Uh, and so on behalf of Mel Yurofsky, uh, and on behalf of myself uh, as the director and producer of the film, here in Philadelphia, I want to correct the record and <laughs> affirm to you that Uriah Levy intended, wanted to leave Monticello uh, to uh, the congregants at Mikvah Israel. Um, so having corrected myself, uh, I, um, I was not all that familiar with this story myself, uh, but you met uh, in the film Mark Leibson, who uh, along with Mel, Mark himself had written a book on this uh, topic, a, a terrific book called Saving Monticello. Mark published his book 20 some odd years ago, uh, and coincidentally, Mark and I had worked together as journalists in Washington, D.C. way back in the 1980s. Uh, and so I was vaguely familiar with Mark's book, uh, vaguely enough that I had a copy of it sitting on my bookshelf at my home in San Francisco. Uh, but, uh, and I, I think I've admitted this to Mark over the years, I never quite got around to reading it cover to cover. <laughs> All I knew was that it had something to do with a, with a Jew and Monticello. Uh, and so a few years ago, when I was thinking of what I was going to do next as a filmmaker, after having made a couple of Holocaust-related films, I was just kind of daydreaming one day at my home in San Francisco, and my mind and my eyes kind of floated across my bookshelf, and there was Mark's book, and I pulled it off the shelf, and I kind of reacquainted myself uh, with, with the subject. And I thought, gee, just maybe, maybe, just maybe, this would make for an interesting film. And that's how I got started. Once I became more immersed in the topic, I also realized, in addition to focusing on the story of the Levies and Monticello, their story also provided an opportunity to explore the broader issue uh, that this institution that this museum does such a wonderful job of upstairs of telling the broader story of the Jewish experience in the United States and unfortunately the long history of anti-Semitism in the United States and I realized the, uh, the, the kinds of specific uh, experiences that the Levies had in the course of their long ownership of Monticello was also a window into that long history of anti-Semitism and then I knew I had to a pretty interesting story to tell in this film. How, how long did you work on the film, and were there any challenges in getting material? Any gaps in what you, anything you wanted to find that you weren't able to find in your research? Sure. Um, <coughs> with a little bit of COVID-related interruption, which put a lot of our lives on pause for a little while, uh, I worked on this for two or three years. Um, a lot of the research was covered in the, in the books that Mark and, and Mel Yurofsky had, had published some years ago. Um, but you'll notice that there was a fair amount in the film about uh, the slavery issue, 
uh, both obviously during Thomas Jefferson's time at Monticello, but also, unfortunately, during the pre-Civil War years that the levy, that Uriah Levy owned Monticello, there wasn't much of that material covered in those early books. So I, I wanted to dig a little further into that aspect of the story. It's, uh, as, a, as, 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 a, as a Jewish filmmaker, I have to tell you, it was pretty disturbing to be telling a story about a Jewish family, or at least a Jewish owner, who himself had enslaved people working for him at Monticello, but that's part of the story. Uh, and I definitely uh, wanted the opportunity to explore that. So that, took, that part of the research took a little bit of extra digging uh, into uncovering some of, some of that. Nia Bates, who you saw in the film, uh, has devoted some of her own research to uh, the history of the enslaved community, not just under Jefferson's, not, during, not just during Jefferson's time, but also during the years before the Civil War, and she was extraordinarily helpful in filling some of those gaps. As part of the current conversation we're having you know, in society of retelling stories, uh, to really tell the whole story, how, I think some of the, you know, the, the subjects in the movie talked about that, that it's not just about the Christian white guy and their experience, but the Jews and um, the enslaved people. Is that part of your intent in telling the story? To, it's not to retell history, but to really tell the full history from all these different angles. Well, certainly. Uh, and, and look, a lot of us of a certain age uh, can remember being in history classes, junior high school, high school, perhaps even college, where a lot of these issues weren't addressed quite as critically as they are today. Uh, and that certainly applies to the history of Jews in this country, uh, obviously uh, uh, the history of African Americans in this country. And so here, I really did have an opportunity not only in shining a very well-deserved spotlight for all the right reasons of this Jewish family and the vital role they played. Look, every time I would mention to people, uh, friends of mine, what I was working on during the course of, 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 of putting this film together, uh, uh, what always really stunned them, perhaps more than anything else, is when I mentioned that the Levies owned Monticello longer than Thomas Jefferson and his descendants. I mean, that's just a stunning thing to think about. Levy lines and all. Um, and, uh, and, and so, yeah, so I, I, and again, Monticello itself has done a nice job in, in recent decades of acknowledging the Levies, as opposed to the first several years when the foundation as the film mentions, went out of their way really to erase the history of the levees. So yes, I, I did feel that opportunity to, to tell the story. As, as Dan Jurd in, in, in the film says, the good, the bad, the ugly. And, and that certainly applies to the story of the levees uh, as, as well in terms of tracing their relationship uh, with, uh, with Monticello. And they quote it in, in the movie, kind of the notion that the houses of great men should be preserved like as monuments or as lessons uh, for future generations. Do you think that that's a Jewish value or a value specific for you know, Uriah and Jefferson and Lord Levy? Well, I don't know that that's exclusive to Jews, but it was always striking to me uh, that uh, as both Susan Stein, the longtime curator of uh, Monticello, who by the way is a Philadelphia native, uh, and, and Jonathan Sarna from Brandeis University, they, they both uh, uh, mentioned in the film that, that what Uriah Levy did was the first time that an individual, uh, that anybody took it upon themselves to, to, to preserve a piece of, of American history. As Jonathan says, the, the, the term historic preservation did not exist at all. You know, we take that for granted these days when we, when we see across the street, when we see a place like Independence Hall or Mount Vernon or Monticello, uh, you know, pick a landmark. It's a modern phenomenon that those places have been so lovingly uh, cared for and restored. That wasn't always the case. You know, look, a lot of people to this day think places like Monticello and Mount Vernon and places like that are owned and operated by the federal government. Not true. Monticello 
to this day is owned by the Thomas Jefferson Foundation, the very foundation that purchased it from Jefferson Monroe Levy in 1923. Uh, the Mount Vernon, uh, George Washington's home is owned by the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. So I don't know that it's, that it's particularly a, 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 a Jewish attribute, but fortunately in this case, there was this forward-thinking guy, Uriah Levy, who because of his deep admiration for Thomas Jefferson, largely because of Jefferson's belief in, and uh, an advocacy of religious liberty, did recognize the historic value uh, and poured, him, poured his uh, energies into it and passed that on to his nephew, who then carried the ball for the next several decades. Yeah, it felt like a Jewish value because you know all of our, a lot of our holidays, all of our holidays, about telling the story of our ancestors, commemorating those events. Uh, that's why kind of what stuck out to me. Um, were there um, were you surprised or maybe not really surprised? <laughs> Uh, by the veil, what was called veiled anti-Semitism in the film, but I would say not so veiled anti-Semitism, um, or is that just something, you know, unfortunately, uh, Jews, I'm assuming most of us are Jews in the room, and not necessarily, um, that we're not necessarily surprised about. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, there's, there's, there's very little uh, that surprises me when I hear about episodes of anti-Semitism. Um, I had mentioned earlier that I had made a couple of Holocaust-related films uh, that focused in large part on American figures, uh, and and um, and in both of those uh, in both of those cases, uh, anti-Semitism, and and, and 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 I'm not talking about anti-Semitism in Nazi Germany. I'm talking about anti-Semitism right here in the United States in the 1920s and the 1930s. Uh, it, it's just part of the history of the, of the United States. So when I went back even earlier and learned about this guy, Uriah Levy, who has this 50-year career in the United States Navy, it, it didn't come, unfortunately, sadly, as a great surprise to me to hear that he was so often uh, the subject, the object of anti-Semitism, the sixth courts martial that he faced. Uh, he fought. Uh, he fought a duel. I, it, it, it was left on the cutting room floor for a variety of reasons. Uh, he was once insulted at, a, at an officer's uh, ball right here in Philadelphia, uh, and uh, and one thing led to another, and they crossed the river into uh, New Jersey. Uh, dueling was not legal in Pennsylvania, but was legal in New Jersey. Uh, and Uriah Levy. Uh, perhaps to his credit, uh, fought a duel, shot, killed the guy, and then was acquitted on grounds of self-defense. Uh, the, the bottom line is anti-Semitism, uh, unfortunately, is as old as the country itself, indeed older than the country itself. Um, so you shared one uh, story about the connection to Philadelphia. Any other uh, connections to Philadelphia that uh, didn't make it into the movie? Uh, well, uh, there are a few things. Uh, uh, there's a reference to uh, uh, Uriah's grandfather, Jonas Phillips, who was active in the Revolutionary War movement. I think there's a couple of references to Jonas Phillips upstairs in, in, in the museum. Um, there were one or two other connections, uh, uh, not necessarily Philadelphia related. I got very, very excited uh, early on in my research when I was beginning to put this project together to learn that Emma Lazarus was a distant cousin of the Levies. I got super excited. I thought, oh, this is great. We can't make this up. Emma Lazarus, the woman who writes the new Colossus, the woman who says, give me your tired, your poor. What could be more Jewish and American? And, uh, and it just didn't work. Emma did not fit into the film. Um, my associate producer, my film editor, they all said, you know, Steve, uh, we're getting a little far afield. I said, but it's Emma Lazarus. <laughs> so I want to give a shout out to Emma Lazarus and apologize to Emma Lazarus for leaving her on the cutting room floor. Uh, well, I hope, well, I have a whole notebook of questions. I want to open it up to the audience. Uh, so raise your hand. Uh, 
See, gentlemen over yeah. here. Yeah. Just shout it out and I repeat it. Come. Could this film be considered a gateway into Jewish preservation of monuments? I give uh, David Rubenstein and went down the hill from uh, Monticello, Montpelier, and also the Waters and the, the synagogue, the great synagogue in Budapest, and others I don't know about. Sure. Is this a gateway to other uh, preservation efforts, uh, whether they're funded by Jews or not? Well, I, you know, I'd like to think, and the examples you gave, people like David Rubenstein and, 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 and Ronald Lauder, you know, we're talking about people who have been extraordinarily generous in doing, in doing just that and, and, uh, and donating, contributing, you know, literally hundreds of millions of dollars to that effort. Uh, some folks might have noticed the name of Ambassador John Lowe, uh, former, a former ambassador way back in the Reagan years, who himself has been, uh, he's a gentleman now in his early 90s, uh, very, very active in uh, Jewish philanthropy and in supporting those kinds, of, those kinds of efforts. So I'd like to think that those folks are there, uh, whether or not they contribute to my film projects, uh, but, but I think they're out there, uh, and I'd like to think that there is, these days, ongoing interest in those kinds of preservation efforts. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, here, in, here in Philly, you know, the city is filled with, uh, with wonderful examples of that kind of historic preservation, and what a loss it would be to our society if we did have those uh, physical, physical reminders uh, of, of, of what this country has stood for uh, over the past few centuries. I can't this film ever be seen on television or any other venues, or is it only going to be on the Jewish Film Festival? Circuit? So the question is, where, where will this film be seen, whether it's on television? Uh, for the past several months, uh, it has been on the film festival circuit. It will continue that wonderful journey uh, for some months to come. I, as a filmmaker, I've been very, very fortunate. My first film wound up on HBO. My second film about the Vatican uh, and the Holocaust was a PBS film. Uh, at some point next year, uh, I'll sit down with my film distributor in Los Angeles and we'll, and we'll talk about where it might go. The nice thing these days, particularly for documentary filmmakers, is there are uh, a lot of platforms available, streaming, whether it's Netflix, Amazon, whatever. So I'd like to think, I'm optimistic that at some point, at some point perhaps later next year, uh, it'll be available that way. But for now, for the next uh, number of months, it's on, the, it's on the festival circuit. Tell your friends in other cities. Uh, the guy in the gray uh, beige sweater behind her. Yep. Uh, from a historical perspective, how is Uriah Levy regarded by the United States Navy? Does he appear in the history of the Navy? That's a great question. How is Uriah Levy regarded by the United States Navy? Uh, as opposed to how he was regarded during his life, uh, when he was a bit of a rogue, a bit of a pariah, uh, he, is, he is very fondly remembered. Uh, and indeed, uh, you saw toward the end of the film, uh, the Uriah Levy Chapel, that's on the grounds of the Naval Academy in Annapolis. Uh, and so the Navy, all these decades later, has, has very nicely, I think, on, honored him. Uh, there, uh, there is a wonderful uh, museum on the grounds of the Naval Academy in Annapolis that has a number of artifacts related to Uriah Levy. Uh, the full-length portrait uh, that once hung proudly at Monticello uh, now is uh, held at, uh, and displayed at the Naval Academy uh, in Annapolis. So I think they've done a very, very nice job of recognizing uh, his legacy uh, and, uh, and, and his history and his accomplishments, not, as, not necessarily as the owner of Monticello, but as a career naval officer. Again, for her. You take the film up to the 2017, Jews will not replace us now. Yes. If you were still working on the film, what would you do with the past five years? Uh, hang my head in despair. Uh, the, the, the question was, the film culminates in the tragedy of Charlottesville in 2017. If I was still working on this film today, 
what would I do with all? And, and, and unfortunately, there's a long list of things that have happened uh, since 2017 up until you know, just you know, days and weeks ago. Um, you know, look, as Jonathan Sarna so eloquently says in the film, uh, it always starts with the Jews, it never ends with the Jews, and unfortunately, that's part of our, what we're struggling with as a country, uh, and I think uh, that's something that, quite sadly, is gonna remain with us. So I hope that people keep that in mind and obviously don't think that uh, the problems ended uh, with Charlottesville in, in 2017. But thank you for that. Okay. Two little details. Where was Mrs. Littleton and her gang when the property was finally announced for sale? And has any of that $26 million been awarded? Uh, so two questions. Where was Ma Littleton and her gang, she was the woman who led the campaign to take Monticello away from Jefferson Levy. Where was she when, or what was, what was her status when Levy finally agreed to sell uh, Monticello? You know, I actually don't know the answer to that question. I, I, I think she ultimately would have been satisfied uh, that, uh, that Monticello wound up in the hands of the foundation. That, that really was her, uh, that was her objective, and as Mel Yurofsky points out in the film, uh, there was, there was, you could make an argument that that was a legitimate thing she was trying to do. Unfortunately, the woman was very anti-Semitic, and she went about it in a rather crude, uh, crude and, uh, and not very nice way. Uh, as for the, the $26 million civil uh, jury verdict against the perpetrators of the violence in Charlottesville, I'm not, I haven't looked at it lately. I, I'm not sure that any, uh, any amount of money has actually been paid out. Uh, that would not surprise me. Uh, so I think to a certain degree, we're talking about a sort of symbolic victory. Um, look, I mean, I, I, I sort of put it in the same category as the $1.4 billion <laughs> rightly deserved verdict against Alex Jones at InfoWars. Uh, and whether or not any of that money will ever be recovered Obviously, it matters to a certain extent, but it's more the power of that award to say, we are going to hold you accountable for your words, your deeds, and your actions. And I put that really in the same category as the jury verdict that arose from what happened in Charlottesville in 2017. We have questions in the back. Well, anti-Semitic tropes are exhausting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sir, yeah, the question is the only recognition of the family, the burial ground of Rachel at, the, at Monticello, is that it? Uh, yeah, in terms of the sort of physical existence or manifestation or recognition of the levies at Monticello, uh, is uh, Rachel's uh, gravesite and the signage that exists. Uh, that said, uh, look, I mean, the, the, the folks who run Monticello certainly recognize that people are coming to Monticello because of Thomas Jefferson, not, not because of the Levy family. But the docents these days at Monticello certainly are familiar with the Levy story. If the subject comes up, they, they do a very nice job of explaining the history. They're not trying to erase the Levies. They're not trying to hide the fact that a Jewish family owned Monticello. Uh, but it still remains a shrine to Thomas Jefferson. So there are, in the house itself, a lot of those sort of gaudy furnishings that you saw from Jefferson Monroe Levy's days, none of that exists. Uh, I, I should add very quickly, since there's a brief aside about the Levy lines and, and, the, and the funny mistake that happened when they wound up on that $2 bill back in the yeah. 20s, uh, the, found, the, 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 the Jefferson Foundation has located and has repurchased 
the levy lines. They, they're not quite sure what they're gonna do with them yet. And, and chances are, they're not gonna put them back out on display, but at least I'll give them credit for wanting at least to bring them back to Monticello, uh, regardless of what they're actually gonna do with them once they get there. Uh, I would love to continue the questions, but I got the wrap it up signal. Uh, I actually will close up with two questions. One, uh, any uh, record of the ladies having a Seder, putting up a mezuzah, or lighting a menorah uh, at Monticello? Great, great question. It, it, it often comes up, and I, I got to tell you that, again, when I was telling friends about, uh, about what I was working on, uh, particularly some of my Jewish friends in, back home in San Francisco, they all said, you got to find out if there are any satyrs in Monticello because, they, because of the obvious irony of a Jewish family, particularly before the Civil War, this a, a notion of a Passover Seder uh, retelling the story of the passage from bondage to freedom. Uh, and the folks at Monticello, the, the curatorial staff and the conservators there, they have looked for evidence um, Kind of a kind of a, 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 a disappointing answer to to the question is that the levies were very assimilated. They were proud to be Jewish, but they weren't particularly observant Jews. There's there's no there's nothing in the historical record that tells us whether or not there were ever any Passover seders at at Monticello. Um, Susan Stein, the curator from Monticello, uh, several years ago asked. Uh, uh, asked the folks at Monticello to start inspecting doorways for nail holes because she did want to look for evidence of mezuzot and as Susan says, we didn't find any nail holes, Steve. Uh, so there's no reason to believe uh, that there were any mezuzahs or if there were, uh, somebody a long time ago did a really good job of spackling up the holes so there's, there's no evidence. Uh, but uh, it, it would be nice to it would be the epitome of irony uh, had there been an actual Passover Seder uh, at, at Monticello. Uh, Steve, I want to thank you for making this movie. I personally found it. <laughs>